This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Sober Spaces in the Punk and Anarchist Scenes by Mo Carnage Within the punk and anarchist scenes, there are many activities that are interest to a broad spectrum of individuals, including people who drink, smoke, use drugs, people who never have, and people who are recovering addicts to certain substances. The problem is that many of these activities end up being organized in such a way that they are only accessible to people who drink, smoke, or do drugs, or are willing slash able to tolerate those who do so. This means that there are significant sections of the populations who are either put in situations that are uncomfortable and lead to mental and physical health problems, even relapse, or are not able to attend at all. It splits our community and it limits our community. This is even a bad situation for people who do drink, smoke, do drugs. Because if they are not exposed to people who are sober, they may not realize that they don't always have to get fucked up to have a good time. At CLIT, Combating Latin Inequality Together Fest in RVA in the summer of 2007, there was a really important discussion about substance use and abuse within the punk scene. There was a combination of users, ex-users, straight-edgers, free substance folks, etc. Basically, the full spectrum was there. Some of the ideas that were brought up were about how hard it is to be a recovering addict of any sort within the punk scene. Many people do not take others' addiction seriously and spend more time goading them to return to substance abuse than they do supporting them. A lot of people spoke about how hard it is to not use when there was a pressure to be fun again, etc. An issue of venues was brought up. Many punk shows happen at bars and clubs within bars. Even house parties typically include alcohol. A lot of punks will decide not to go to a show if they know they cannot drink there. I went to a house show a year or two ago where money was being taken at the door for the keg, not the bands, so I didn't give any money. I was later chided by someone for not paying for beer I wouldn't drink. That situation is hella awkward for folks who want to stay sober. There's a lot of work to be done within the punk scene to be supportive of people with drug addictions who are in recovery. The creation of sober spaces would be a good start. If there were shows where there were not alcohol, more people would come. Not to mention that those shows would not have to be 21+, plus, so younger people could come too. I'm doing a self-education thing right now to learn more about civil rights, because I know jack shit about that time period. I finally read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I found that while some parts really frustrated or confused me, other parts made perfect sense. For instance, there was some things that seemed to be relevant to the straight edge idea, because Malcolm X dealt with substance abuse issues and then stopped using after he joined the Nation of Islam. Here are some quotes from Malcolm X that particularly struck me. Quote, One day, I remember, a dirty glass of water was on a counter, and Mr. Muhammad put a clean glass of water beside it. You want to know how to spread my teachings, he said, and he pointed to the glasses of water. Don't condemn if you see a person has a dirty glass of water, he said. Just show them the clean glass of water that you have. When they inspect it, you won't have to say that yours is better. End quote. Autobiography of Malcolm X, page 209. I know I have been guilty of being on the condemning side more often than I ought to have. And while probably none of us will be able to always set a good example and have that be enough, because the temptation to rag on others is too strong, it is a really good idea to keep in mind. Being all-righteous does not make people want to be like you. It makes them more likely to rebel just to spite you. Straight-edge people in general could benefit from more leading by example. Be a fun, active, kind person, and others might start asking you about quitting and moving on. If they can see that being edge does not make you an asshole, they might be more tempted to join in. And this certainly applies to more things than sobriety. Anarchists and organizers in general can gain a lot out of positive energy, out of creating new realities and better solutions, not just criticizing the dominant structures. Another quote. Quote, 
I knew that our strict moral code and discipline was what repelled them most. I fired at this point, at the reason for our code. The white man wants black men to stay immoral, unclean, and ignorant. As long as we stay in these conditions, we will keep on begging him and he will control us. We can never win freedom and justice and equality until we are doing something for ourselves. End quote. Autobiography of Malcolm X, page 225. This, for me, is another strong reason why sobriety and anarchism go so well together. The idea that inebriation is a form of oppression has been brought up in other contexts, too, but I still don't think it is ever brought up enough or taken seriously enough. I don't know the best way to approach this position. How do you talk to someone about the way that their inebriation contributes to their oppression? It can easily come out sounding so conspiracy theory-ish that people reject it offhand. For many radical anarchist-type people, the idea of discipline is not well received. But self-serving discipline is a good thing. Being able to control oneself to one's benefit is great. Being able to wake up when you want to, exercise, eat well, stay healthy, and not over-imbibe are all positive ways of being. The easiest point to strike with anarchists and radicals is how, as consumers of certain products, they are supporting corporations and practices that they otherwise do not support. People who won't drink soda but buy cigarettes, or drink beer but refuse to own a car. No one is perfect, and no one should be a hypocrisy cop, because they would first have to arrest themselves. But there are some very blatant ways that people's substance use and abuse hurts them, and it is not consistent with everything else they stand for. Drug abuse hurts our communities, hurts ourselves, and makes us weaker. We need to develop healthier ways to escape. Maybe even more permanent escape, like a better community, neighborhood, town, world. Another group that I think confronts substance abuse in important ways are the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico. They have long had a policy which is reflected in individual communities of a prohibition on drugs and alcohol. There are multiple reasons for this. The harm caused in their communities from alcohol, i.e. drunk and irresponsible men not taking care of their families, domestic abuse, etc. Also, if there are illegal drugs being grown, consumed, or trafficked through their regions, that is just the excuse the government needs to severely crack down on the Zapatistas. Also, if there are illegal drugs being grown, consumed, or trafficked throughout their regions, that is just the excuse the government needs to severely crack down on the Zapatistas. Being intoxicated on any level greatly reduces the alertness of the community members who may need to be ready for an attack at any time. I think that the Zapatistas are a good example along these lines of why a revolutionary or even just revolting group ought to not engage in the consumption of drugs or alcohol. There's too much to lose. There are issues of patriarchy, child abuse, domestic abuse, rape culture, etc. that also stem or are exacerbated by drugs and alcohol and drug and alcohol culture. There are studies and essays and even songs about these correlations and many valid reasons why drug and alcohol contribute to making our communities less safe and less inclusive than they could be, and we deserve better. There are some places where only sober folks go. However, the reality of it is that sober people want to be able to hang out with people who sometimes use as well. Typically, the sober-only population is pretty small. It would be cool if there were some compromises by everybody so they could all hang out comfortably sometimes. This will probably look different in different communities, but it needs to be addressed everywhere. One thing I really appreciate is when people go out of their way to check with me about whether or not it's okay for them to drink beer around me, smoke pot, or a cigarette in certain space or whatever. My friend Jono does that when I'm hanging out with him in New Orleans, and I really appreciate it. Asking people if it's okay for you to drink or smoke or blow some coke or eat meat or take your shirt off or kiss them, etc. are all ways we can make others more comfortable and show our respect for them. Because using consent to build healthier relationships has more to it than just sexual consent. Right now, at the Wingna Anarchist Collective, one thing we've been trying is radical recovery support group meetings, a non-AA 
non-NA approach to peer support for folks trying to get or stay sober. We also host sober events to make them accessible, but sober folks can't do it alone. There's definitely a real need in the punk and anarchist scenes for non-sober people to step up as allies and attend sober events, host sober events, and take an active role in calling out shitty behavior when it happens. Intoxication is never an excuse. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.